we have a fairly tight slot, but we will aim to um, give the audience ample time to engage with the panelists, and um, hopefully they'll also be able to address some of the questions that we were not able to take earlier on. So um, I'll begin the introduction right away. So at the far end is Professor James Wood. James is head of Department of Veterinary Medicine and also Cambridge Africa Program Champion for Biological Sciences. He has been extremely prolific in attracting funding and in helping to expand the breadth of research fields covered by Cambridge Africa. As we heard this morning, James has large collaborations in Ghana, but also in Ethiopia, where he's working on bovine TB, persistence and control. Um, sat next to him is Dev Dr. Devon Curtis. Devon is senior lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Studies here in Cambridge. Her research is focused on post-conflict power sharing and governance arrangements in the Great Lakes region of Africa. She's also a champion for social sciences and humanities and has been instrumental in driving the strategy for collaboration between Cambridge and African partners. And just between James and Devon, we have Dr. Sarah Sally. Sally. Sarah is Associate Professor of Gender Studies and also Dean of School of Women and Gender Studies at Makerere University. She has vast research experience in social science dimensions of health. As CAPREX champion, she's playing a crucial role in facilitating networking and research collaborations between social and biomedical scientists at Makerere and at Cambridge. And last but not least, we have Professor Alison Elliott. Alison is Professor of Tropical Medicine at the London School of, Tropic of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and also Founding Director of MUI, uh, which also now has partners in Kenya, the Gambia, and Gabon. Alison has been working in Africa for about 30 years now, initially in Zambia, and is now based in Ghana, where she has been putting a lot of effort in opening up pathways in science research in Africa. Please join me in welcoming our panel. It's on now. So the topic of today's discussion is why support Cambridge Africa? In other words, why support capacity building in Africa? And of course, our esteemed panel will present us with thought-provoking ideas on the matter. Um, perhaps we could begin with something about research excellence. So the University of Cambridge and Cambridge-based um, research institutes are known for their excellence in basic science. One could argue that when engaging with Africa, what one really needs is practical solutions. So why not focus, for example, on basic infrastructure and possibly translating the large reservoir of already existing knowledge into policy and practice? Alison, is there a strong case for supporting basic um, science in Africa? Thank you very much, Watu. As you know, this is one of my favorite things. But... Um, Perhaps we need to be a bit careful about what we mean by basic science, because there's basic science that is, you know, how molecules interact with each other on the surface of cells or, or you know, details of the atomic structure of um, metals or something. Um, but the sort of basic science that I've been connected with is really sort of more applied basic science. So, so I think there's a number of reasons. That's a disclaimer. <laughs> as to what I might be qualified to talk about. So I think, um, you know, um, earlier on in my career, there, ten there tended to be this attitude that you describe of, you know, implementation sciences for Africa and basic sciences for, for elsewhere. But, um, so I have four reasons why. So one is that, in, in my experience, young African scientists are really keen to understand the mechanisms and the basis uh, of, of uh, interactions and things that they observe. And it remind, it's just the same as when I was an undergraduate um, at this uh, illustrious university and went to courses on parasite immunology. And I thought it was really fascinating. And I see that in, my, in, in young uh, African scientists as well, that you, you learn about an observation and you want to understand the mechanisms behind it. So they're keen and excited and it's really 
And so from, you know, it's a thrill for, for, for people uh, to have the opportunity to foster that talent. So that's one reason that they want to do it. Um, the second is that uh, these are kind of the fundamentals of addressing African problems. And we've seen several examples today, I think. So um, one that I always think about is the Ebola, the recent Ebola epidemic. And there was an Ebola epidemic in, in Uganda in 2000, where there were over 400 cases and over 200 deaths. And you can't help feeling that if Uganda had had the opportunity to develop an Ebola vaccine, they would have done it uh, then, and that would have um, uh, prevented the problems that happened in uh, 15 years later. And so um, if African scientists are equipped to address African problems from the basics, then uh, that can have benefits for Africa, but also global uh, benefits. Then the third, uh, third reason is that it is possible. And again, we've seen today from what Ian talked about, what Gordon talked about, that it's possible to set up uh, basic science labs uh, in Africa. Um, and, uh, and if we can do that, it sort of uh, provides for sustainability. So uh, whereas um, international funding may have um, f sort of fashions of supporting science in Africa, but if African science is uh, developed on its own uh, footing, then in the long run, it'll also it'll be great for Africa and also great for people from Europe who want to engage in, in African um, problems because the partnerships will be there. And finally, just of course, we are a global, uh, we're increasingly global uh, community and we need to see equity in global science. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else who would like to add something to that? Yeah. Thank you. It's just to expound on the last point she has said, because knowledge production is also a political process. I know she called it equity, but I think this equation whereby Africans are simply consumers of knowledge has to come to an end somewhere. Because it's true Africans can generate knowledge and can know, but they are not facilitated. So what you end up seeing is that the Africans who can do it have to be taken out of the continent and to relocate for for them to be able to do it. So in addition to all the points that she has said, it is also a political process. And I think it's important that Africans are also inserted at the space of knowledge generation, not just knowledge use. Thank you. You've provided um, very powerful arguments for basic science research in Africa, but how does one actually move from the bench here in Cambridge, you know, in a Western country, to supporting efforts um, with local challenges in Africa. Um, for example, Ian, Ian Goodfellow here did not um, uh, tell us that he had to bulldoze his way into helping with the Ebola crisis you know, by relentlessly you know, explaining how his um, diagnostic skills would be relevant to constraining um, uh, the crisis. Um, and I can think of you know, other areas. For example, there's a question of funding. Uh, there's also the question of the legislative framework, for example, to do with um, exchange of biological materials or um, ethical conduct of research. James, what's your view on this matter? I think that's about 10 questions in one. <laughs> I think the process of, of, of uh, starting this sort of program, I mean, if you just take the examples of how the collaborations uh, with, with the University of Ghana, which started in a very small scale, grew into being partnerships through, through the, the um, Carnegie Corporation funded uh, CAPREX program. Um, it was a, a series of, of chance encounters and, um, and based on a, a small-scale research project that, that uh, on um, one li wildlife species that hosted some nasty viruses in Ghana, bat species, um, uh, led me to meet one scientist who just happened to be then the, um, the, the dean of, of graduate studies, uh, shortly to be the pro-vice-chancellor who set up um, ORID. Um, and it wasn't because of, uh, I was introduced to her as the, um, to, to Ya and Tioma Beidou, who, um, as the, the Dean of Graduate Studies, and I was thinking, I really don't want to get mired in, in more academic bureaucracy. 
um, because it's bad enough in Cambridge, and doing it in Ghana as well was going to be even worse. And um, it turned out then that uh, with a brief conversation with me and my, my local Ghanaian collaborator, a wildlife vet, Richard Suiri, that uh, Jan knew far more about this species of bat that we were both interested in working on than both of us did put together. And, uh, and from that one conversation grew a, a, grew a collaboration, which then grew into a um, request for, uh, for help, um, trying to place a couple of mathematician um, fellows that, that Jan had, uh, University of Ghana had support for in Cambridge. That, that never happened, but through those conversations, uh, we built up the concept of University of Ghana being a potential partner in, in the CAPREX program. So, so it was really organic, um, just from a little acorn. Um, it's grown into it's, something that, that may be a young oak now, and, um, and, I, and it's, uh, it's been a, a, a great privilege to be part of that. But it's, I mean, in terms of the questions of, of dealing with, with all of the ethical issues that surround research, working overseas, I mean, those are complicated whether you're working between um, the UK and Ghana or Ghana and the UK or, or the US. You have different uh, legislative frameworks to, to, to work within. Um, at, actually, it's sometimes easier to work with, with countries that share a bit of a framework, and um, Ghana and I think Uganda both have the um, fortune or misfortune of, of having a lot of British legal systems that underpin a lot of their legal structures, which make at least the lawyers to speak the same language, even if there are different attitudes underlying it. So, that, so there are um, uh, things that you have to do, but those processes actually aren't any different um, to setting, a, uh, setting up a collaboration with, with, uh, with, another, uh, with an institution in North America. Um, in terms of the processes you have to go through, the opportunities in terms of funding sometimes are, sometimes are harder. So, uh, there are very different, ch difficult challenges. I mean, we talked about, Gordon talked about the, the growth of facilities in his particular center. I mean, I remember the first time visiting the biochemistry department, there weren't any facilities in it, really, to speak of. I mean, it was really not a, it, it was a teaching department, not a research department. You wouldn't say the same, I mean, I think that you've heard a lot about the teaching, but actually you wouldn't say the same now. And those things just change over time, and, and there's more of a need. Uh, I mean, we, we've been lucky to get some grants to, to equip the virology lab that, that Gordon described earlier today, through two or three research grants. Um, some, th some coming through the Alborada funding, some coming from RC GCRF funding, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and Gordon started on a much bigger scale in his department as a whole. And uh, I, uh, I think it's just a question of, uh, of finding uh, people you want to work with, finding interesting research questions that are important to both of you, um, and getting on and doing them and, have, and having fun in the, in the process and, and trying to do it in the right way. Um, but it's... Uh, it's lucky that we've been able to, to build some research capacity um, as part of that whole program, which has clearly been, uh, well, I think very important for everyone concerned. Thank you. Just to pick up on one of the last points you made about interesting research questions. Um, in the context of Africa, and in fact, everywhere else, very often um, it's about complex multi-dimensional problems that probably require multi-disciplinary uh, approaches. And um, I know, Sarah, you've been working for quite a number of years on um, uh, health issues as a social scientist. And uh, James also works uh, increasingly with uh, social scientists at the Department of Veterinary Medicine. But Sarah, I'd like to hear, have a perspective from you on what this actually means. Is it something that is actually practicable or is it just an idea that is hanging on a thread? What are the issues that mean that this is relevant to the African context? It's a very difficult question. <laughs> because we've been talking about multidisciplinarity for a long time, but what it actually means remains a challenge. First of all, I think I want to say that it is very good, or it is an intention we should all pursue multidisciplinarity. Of course, we come from a background whereby Medicine was on its own, health was on its own, and then you had the social scientists on their own. And then one thing that struck us as a country was the HIV epidemic. For the first time, we, we had a health crisis which did not respect 
these boundaries or these knowledge silos as we knew them, it became very important in the management of HIV to understand the social dimensions of it, to understand the socioeconomics of it, to understand the politics of it. And given the kind of work we've always done, because personally I, I, I start off as a political scientist and then I end up in health systems. So it's really, most of the time I always say I deal with the politics of healthcare things. But anyway, the issue is, it is very important that we have a multidimensional aspect of things or multidisciplinary aspect of things because diseases and their manifestations are not only biomedical. They are very multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. But the challenge has been that in as much as the spirit is willing, the practicalities uh, remain a challenge. And one of the major challenges is that people really don't know what to do to make multidisciplinary research actually multidisciplinary. Does it simply mean the scientists develop their research agenda and then, oh, yeah, let us see what the social scientists have to add on? Or does it mean the social scientists develop and then the scientists, normally it's one way in that you find, considering that most of the research funding is on the science side, you'll always have the scientists leading the research. And then somewhere along the way, because some donor has said, oh, it should have been interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, then they remember, oh, can we get a social scientist on? So as a social scientist, we are always added on just as either to justify the process or you added on just because there are certain things the medics cannot understand or sometimes the medics think, yeah, actually social science is very easy. We, they're just asking community things. We can do that ourselves. And so you always <laughs> end up with lack of understanding of what multidisciplinarity is, but also what we are now doing, especially in the research industries, to find out what does it really mean to be multidisciplinary and how do we do this? And I think coming together and developing the research programs together is one way of ensuring that the multidisciplinary aspect is going to be captured. And I think it's a goal we should pursue because there's a need. But in a, the other thing I haven't mentioned is while the medical scientists appreciate that side, the social scientists have not yet really appreciated how the medics can get into their research. So that's another challenge. So you have the social scientists and the humanities people doing their kind of work, asking questions and pursuing knowledge generation in a social science and humanities way. And they really don't understand how that the medics or the other scientists should come in. So I think it calls for understanding on both sides, but it is an aspect we should really pursue so as to avoid the knowledge silos, which also have a danger of producing one-sided knowledge and wasting resources in that you know deeply about one thing, but not how it really occurs within the wider ecosystem of things. So I think that's what I can say. Social scientists have got some way to go. Um, how successful do you think Cambridge Africa has been uh, in bringing on board social sciences and humanities? We know that the initial um, focus was on health and biomedical sciences, but um, Devon, is it doing anything about social sciences and humanities, really? Um, the short answer is yes, but before I, I get to the answering that question, I just wanted to say that one of the unexpected benefits, I think for me at least, for being involved in Cambridge Africa is actually also to listen to some of the scientists and to understand how, you know, what, what scientists are doing. And, you know, I never thought that I would be at presentations about antibiotic resistance in Ghanaian livestock and find it interesting. Um, so, so actually, it has really been beneficial in, in a lot of different ways. Now, social sciences specifically, um, there are quite a lot of differences. There's a different way for a lot of us um, in the social sciences and humanities of conducting our research. Um, it tends to be a lot cheaper. Um, it tends to be more individual, I think. It's not the case, that, and certainly we've seen this in CAPREX, it's not the case that um, CAPREX fellows can join a lab. Instead, that collaboration between researchers, between two researchers, becomes, becomes really important. But I suppose back to the kind of question of this panel, which is why support research capacity in Africa? I would say, well, why support research capacity at Cambridge? Because really, for me, this has really been something of mutual benefit. And I think that I've learned a lot, and I've 
through my involvement with Cambridge Africa, I've become a better researcher, and I think a lot of my colleagues in social science and in the social sciences and humanities feel the same way. And I think what we've tried to do with, um, with CAPREX in Cambridge Africa is to link people in terms of collaborations um, who are working on similar but not identical things. So a couple of examples, we had somebody in the Department of Lit Languages and Literature at McCarray who was looking at um, the depiction of homosexuality in literature and we linked him with um, a sociologist, well somebody who does social, a lot of social theory on uh, sort of ideas of sexuality here. And so, you know, they're not working on identical things, but actually both of them can enrich the other's research. And I think another big benefit has actually been on um, expanding networks. So I know that through, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to, to have a couple of collaborators and that's really extended some of my networks. Um, the person that I'm working with right now with Caprex, um, she works on um, autobiographies, but and I've done some work on disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, and I have a postdoc here who works on gender and peace building. And the three of us, again, it, it, it works really well. We're working on different things, but it comes together nicely, and we've just been invited to go to Beijing and to teach a joint course in, in Beijing for, for um, a short course for two weeks, and also to discuss with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences a, a joint project with them. So I think you know, it's really extended a lot of our different networks. Thank you. Why support capacity building in Cambridge or in Africa? We know very well that um, the um, academic career path does not quite reward capacity building. It's about publish and perish. But I wouldn't put that question to you. I promise to open um, the floor to, to the audience and they might want to answer that question actually. So um, we can take questions now from the audience. Can I just raise a question about Nagoya Protocol and how that influences the need to develop local capacity in areas, you know, particularly when you think about infectious diseases. There's a real issue now about ownership of samples and who owns a virus or who owns the sequence of a virus that comes out of a sample that's isolated in a remote part of Peru. Um, surely that has, a, has a, an impact on, um, you know, it's gonna become more and more difficult. My understanding is gonna become more and more difficult for us to simply fly these materials out. Governments are getting more and more um, nervous about allowing biological materials out of the country. So Brazil is a good example with Zika. I th I'm sure you're right that it's getting more and more complicated. And, and actually it's complicated within country as well as between countries, I think, Ian. Well, you know that already. And I think that there are huge disparities in, in power between different um, ethnic groups in many countries um, in the tropics. Uh, where, where those issues, if, if anything, are, are magnified greater than the challenges of working between countries. Um, my, my own view is, is that the way to address that is to try and um, ensure that all of the, uh, that there's adequate uh, capacity built in the labs locally to where you're trying to work so that the, the sequences can be developed, uh, can be produced locally, as you've been doing um, so clearly in McKinney. Um, and the more that we can do that, the more that these issues are just going to be non-issues because actually where something gets sequenced has just become a technical job. I mean, whether it's, w whether it's 20 quid a pop or um, $20, was it? You know? um, and whether we're all going to get our, our own genome sequenced. Actually, the, uh, the, the, the challenges of sequencing anything, I think it will have more or less disappeared um, in terms of conventional things that we might want to se sequence in the next five years. And, uh, and and actually, we should try and avoid these things being an issue because by how we work and where we work, not um, rather, rather than dealing with things in terms of um, flying samples or moving samples around. I think that's the solution to it, not the um, where, where you have clear equality between, within the research group that, that's trying to produce the work, wherever, whether people come from North America, China, Northern Europe, or, or, um, or Uganda or Ghana, or, or, or even Nigeria, dare I say. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that it's, that's very good. What he gave actually would be the ideal to go, but I think it will take a long time for all of us to get there. So one of the things we've done in these countries is other than just building the capacity for the researchers, there are levels called ethical committees. And Uganda has one of, the, it has a powerful bioethics committee, which I know very well. And one of the things they have to do is to discuss the documentation that relates to these things before even the research starts. So it's not just actually discussing the science. You discuss the politics of it, you discuss the economics of it, the morality of it, whether you're moving hair samples or body samples, whatever else it is. So there's a common understanding of how the ownership of this is going to be done by legal teams from the participating countries. And after all that is done, then the research begins. And you'll find that there's a common understanding, there's a trust built. And so we continue to move because we don't have labs in the country to be able to do that. So if you're on the carousels of various airports, you'll always see of our airports, you'll always see these samples going and coming. But it's because everyone knows what it is. So as we wait to build capacity of the labs to do everything where we are, one of the things is to strengthen the bioethics committees and to have trust between the participating countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Femi Ojambati. I'm a postdoc at the Department of Physics. I want to contribute to the discussion about uh, basic science and applied science for Africa. I like the statement she made. She made, why do basic science in Cambridge and elsewhere? So if we are asking why do ba basic science in Africa, there are African scientists that are very curious and of course, it's very nice to want to do applied science to really, really solve a fundamental, I mean, to solve a practical problem in the society. But there are many African scientists that, are, that want to do more than that, that are curious, that want to really understand basic uh, science. And of course, that's how this is done uh, elsewhere in the world, because when you understand what's going on, that's when you can really think about, oh, so what can I do with this? What applications can I be, uh, build on this? I, I am doing a research which, if you ask me the application, of course I can tell you things like quantum computing, which is still really far away. But I am doing it not for the application, but for the interest and yeah, to understand things. And I think African scientists should also be encouraged in this way that it doesn't have to be practical uh, or applied science, but they can really, really want to understand cosmology or want to understand uh, DNA structure. We all need this, and, and if it is possible here in Cambridge and elsewhere, and it should be possible also in Africa too. Of course, there are questions about funding and so on, but if anyone is interested in this sort of research, they should be encouraged. It's, a, it's not a comment, but I mean, it's not a question, but yeah. rather like a comment. Yes, Th thank you for your comment um, and adding to um, the points that were made earlier on. Is there, uh, tea break is awaiting us, um, I'm conscious of that. If there's a burning question from mm -hmm. someone who hasn't already spoken today, uh, I think there's one there at the back. Um, for s someone who hasn't spoken at all today. Yeah, you can so while the... While the microphone uh, gets to that its destination, I just wanted to respond that I, I really like your comment, but I also think it ties in with the um, engagement that Julian was talking about, that um, because um, in a setting where you can have more uh, the opportunity for curiosity-driven uh, research and so on, then you have an obligation to society in a way to share the excitement of what you're, you're learning. So I think... Um, that the initiatives for engaging with the public in Africa as well have been really exciting and uh, lots more to learn from, from people like you, Julian, uh, as to how to do that in, a, in you know, innovative ways. I think the microphone has reached the destination. Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry if this isn't a terribly burning question, but it's particularly to Dr. Curtis. Um, I myself am in social sciences and from South Africa, and um, it seems to be very heavily focused, this Cambridge Africa relationship on the hard sciences. Um, and I was just wondering, as was said earlier by one of the panelists, knowledge is political, and is there, um, does the social science side have a similar sort of 
very strong strategy of creating local support in universities in Africa? And is there space in the light of things like the big decolonization movement and all of these movements in which the African sci social scientists also get a chance to throw a critical lens on knowledge construction here and a critical lens on the problematic past relationships of knowledge construction between Cambridge and Africa? And as social scientists here, how can we go forward trying to work with that? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great question. And I suppose I should have said that Cambridge Africa, I mean, it's, it's an umbrella of all sorts of different programs and works closely with the, um, uh, the Center for African Studies, uh, which is... In, which is a group of social scientists. And one of the things that we're looking at in that center is very much the questions that, that you're addressing, questions of decolonization, thinking through different kinds of institutional relationships that we can have with various universities in, in Africa to, to really think about different kinds of models of partnerships that get to some of the concerns that, that you're raising and, and that Sarah's raised as well. Just maybe to also add that CAPREX in Uganda is largely on the humanities and social science. CAPREX in Ghana is largely on the hard sciences. And of course, that has seen people research things like the Holy Spirit movement, rethinking the state. How do we frame questions of religion, of politics, and everything? So it is a mixed degree, really. But on the Ugandan side, it's largely a humanities thing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there are many other interesting um, ideas we can follow on during the tea break. I would, uh, can we please join me in thanking our panel? Um.